MAC addresses don't require any planning, but IP addresses really do. In this video, we'll talk about the most fundamental concepts about grouping addresses into networks and subnets and how you need to think through that when planning your IP network. I cannot overstate the importance of these core concepts. So take a listen. As always, let me set the context. This video relates to content in volume one, part four, chapter 11, but it's kind of a tricky chapter. There are five separate major sections, the first of which is pretty short, so I'm gonna completely skip it in terms of the YouTube videos. The second section, there's a lot to it, so I'm gonna break it into two YouTube videos. One about visualizing the subnets that are inside a topology, and then one about visualizing addresses inside a subnet. So this video is the first of those, A, if you will, about visualizing subnets in a topology. So within this video, here's the outline that we'll talk about first. I'll give you a, an analogy about IP addresses and postal addresses, focusing on the postal addresses first, and I'll use that theme throughout this video in the next one. And then I'll talk about subnets as seen in a network topology. As always, I'll give you a few extras at the end. So here are the extras. I'll give you the usual advice about what to do with the book section after watching this video. I'll give you, as usual, a review activity to do, but I won't give you any other extras in this case. I'm gonna wait till the end of the other video about this section to do that. All right, let's get into it. IP addresses require planning. So let's look at postal addresses, which also require planning by analogy. So imagine Farmer Odom has a bunch of land and he grows vegetables on his land. And so there's a road and there's his farm. So Farmer Odom at some point in the past built a house and planted some shade trees and put in a driveway. So the postal system just needed one address for this whole piece of land, right? Because the only person that needs to get mail there are the people that live there at Farmer Odom's house. And yes, my grandfather was indeed Farmer Odom, if you will, but that wasn't his address. So there we have him at 2048 County Line Road. And then Farmer Odom got older and said, you know, enough of this. I'm tired of growing vegetables. I'm going to sell the land and cash out, if you will. And somebody can develop the land. And maybe because things were growing around there, they'd build a subdivision. So now we've got this Odomville subdivision, if you will. And they put some streets in. They got permits to do that. And they put in, you know, plumbing and electricity and all the utilities. And they named the streets. Now, it turns out they couldn't just willy-nilly name the streets whatever they wanted to, although you can tell from these names, especially Cherry Cherry Street, that they had a lot of fun naming their streets. But these streets had to be unique in this town. Otherwise, it would confuse the poor postal workers, right? So they couldn't just pick up any old names they wanted. And then when they started putting houses in, they had to follow some rules, right? Like they couldn't reuse the same street address, notice 1230, 1240, 1250. And all of those follow a pattern. They're all even numbers. Maybe the even numbers go on the left and the odd numbers go on the right side of the street in this place. We'd put street addresses in for the houses that go on Cherry Leaf Lane and some over on Cherry Pie Place. So there'd be some rules about what numbers could be used and what street names could be used to make sure that the postal system worked. And we can imagine these. We weren't really taught these rules, but it's kind of obvious if you sit back and look at it. It's like, hey, we need unique addresses. We need them to be in order on a street. Makes it easier to deliver the mail. They need to be unique on each street so on and so forth, right? So we've all seen this kind of thing before. But if I just sit back and compare some of those addresses, they just need to be a little different so that the postal workers know to deliver a letter to one house versus another, like an address 1230 versus 1240, we know, hey, if it's addressed to 1230, deliver the letter there, duh, right? So we want unique addresses. So if I look at this 1230 Cherry Cherry Street, it's unique compared to the 1240 Cherry, 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 cherry Street, although most of the address is the same. And that's important in our analogy to compare it to IP addresses. Over here on Cherry Pie Place, we might reuse the same street number. We don't in this case, but we could have had a 1230 address over here on Cherry Pie Place. As long as there's something unique about the address, things should work okay. So 
let's take that postal address analogy and start talking about computer networking and IP. We've got a router, and just like we've got a blank canvas, so to speak, with a farm that we're developing into a subdivision, imagine you're building a network. Every time we added a street in the postal analogy, we, we had a different set of addresses, right? The addresses on that street, the addresses on this second street, the addresses on this third street, right? Well, in, in networking, every time you have a router and you've got a new interface off of it, you conceptually want to think that's a new set of addresses. And we call that set of addresses a subnet or subnetwork. So here, router one, it's got an interface. That's a physical connector. It's hooked up to a switch. And we've got some devices off of that. If the switch is set up to have all these ports in one VLAN, we'll need one subnet. So all the IP addresses, their addresses will follow some rules that place them numerically into the same subnet, much like a postal address. The very nature of its value, the text in the address, places it on the same street as the other addresses. So if we do the same thing on the right, we've got an interface. We've got a switch with a VLAN configured. All the ports are in one VLAN, so we need one subnet. And we're going to have that subnet be subnet number two. It's a different set of addresses versus the left-hand subnet. But within this subnet on the right, the addresses are similar, just like the addresses on the same street would be similar. Think of it as a second street or a third street up here, a third VLAN, a third subnet. In fact, whenever you see a VLAN, you want to think, oh, from an IP perspective, those addresses are going to be in a different subnet than some other devices in another subnet. All right. Now, we haven't really talked about IP addresses in a while, so to get a few facts out, they're dotted decimal numbers, meaning they're decimal numbers separated by periods or dots. Each of those decimal numbers can range from 0 through 255, which means they represent eight binary digits or eight bits. So if I have 8 bits, 8 bits, 8 bits, 8 bits, they add up to 32 bits. So you can look at the IP addresses in binary, as is represented generically here. Or specifically, these numbers, 10 converts to these 8 bits, 12 converts to these 8 bits, and so on. You can look at the actual value in binary, although most of the time we prefer to work with it in this decimal format, right? All right, keeping that in mind, it's easy to think of postal addresses as being grouped together because we've kind of lived with it all our lives. But what about IP addresses? They're kind of new in that regard. Well, let's talk about this idea of grouping them together into subnets, an IP version 4 subnet. So what is it? Well, it's a set of addresses, kind of like the addresses on a street. So that's the analogy, if you will. So they're similar in some way, but how are they similar? Well, first off, they're consecutive numbers. They come from a set of numbers that look very similar. They're going to be one right after the other. And within any one subnet, they'll have an identical part and a part that's different. So some, of the, some part of the address is the same and some part is different. And it's the first half, the left-hand half of the number, that's the same in all addresses. And it's not exactly half. It's just the left-hand part. In the line between what's the same and different on the right varies based on some choices you make. And that's the hard part, right? It's flexible, so it's more challenging to learn. But for now, we'll give you some simple examples. That line that defines what's the same in all addresses and what's different is defined by something called the subnet mask, all right? So more about that as we move along. Now, why is this important? Well, IP routing, which makes the world go round, relies on you implementing subnetting correctly, just like the postal system relies on the people that pave former farms to follow the rules of setting up the roads and making sure the new road names are unique and you're not duplicating street addresses and so on. It's important that we follow the rules with IP addresses as well. All right, so it doesn't work unless we do that right. So let's talk through some of the rules in the most basic case. Here we've got a switch. All the ports are in one VLAN, so we need one subnet. So we're going to give IP addresses to these PCs. And let's just say we gave them these addresses with some other rules that I've assumed that I'm not going to get into yet. Notice they're consecutive. 
And it's not that they have to be consecutive, but they're going to be near to each other numerically. And the part that's going to be the same is on the left side of the addresses, kind of like in U.S. postal addresses, the part that's the same is on the end of the address, if you will. Now, the router itself, its interface, will also be connected to the subnet. So it will have an IP address that's similar. Notice all four of these addresses begin with 1011. And that would be true of probably the single simplest subnet that you can create. You can create subnets with different rules, but for this subnet, it's a subnet whose rule basically is all addresses that begin 1011 are in this subnet. All right? And I'll tell you why that is as we learn more. So here's the rule. Within this subnet, the part that's the same, that's the same as 1011. The part that's different from address to address to address is that fourth number. And that fourth number is called an octet. So the fourth octet versus the first three octets, if you will. So where do you need these? Well, I've said it a few times, but everywhere you have a VLAN, you need a subnet. So a VLAN is a layer two concept. It's implemented in layer two switches. But for those devices in that VLAN, like the PCs and the routers, they'll have IP addresses in one subnet. Each serial link needs a subnet. So two routers on the end of a serial link, they'll be in a subnet. Two routers on the end of an Ethernet WAN link, they'll be in a subnet. And for a CCNA perspective, that's pretty much all you need to know about where you need subnets in a topology. So just taking you through a few examples, if switch one, all its ports defaulted to be in VLAN one, then these devices IP addresses would just need to be in the same subnet, whatever subnet number it was. It's just labeled there as subnet 1. But instead, if the top three ports were assigned to VLAN 10 and the bottom three to VLAN 20, the IP addresses would need to be in two different subnets. All right, so two subnets because there's two VLANs. In this case, if we had a single VLAN configured on each switch, we'd need one subnet for each. Subnets 1, 2, and 3. Here's that serial WAN link. We'd need a subnet for it. Here's that Ethernet WAN link. We'd need a subnet for it. So I just ran through a few examples. So you want to start getting used to looking at topology diagrams and figuring out how many subnets will I need based on what I see in that diagram. One last one just to give you some perspective. Over here on the left, I've noted in this particular diagram that we've got 12 VLANs defined on the left. And on the right, we've got three branch offices, each with two, v two VLANs defined. How many subnets now? Well, 12 here. 2 plus 2 plus 2 more gives me 18 plus 1 each on the WAN link. So that's 21 subnets total needed in this design. You have to plan this out ahead of time. They don't just happen. So this is the beginning of understanding that planning process. So that's it for the core of this video about the book. So far, this video hasn't covered anything that you then need to go back and look at the book for more information, but I do suggest you keep watching Find Video 2B, that is the video about the second part of what's in that section, and watch that. So that's something to do. Also, I've got a short review video for you that basically shows you topology diagrams and says to you, hey, how many subnets do you need? It's a fairly straightforward exercise, but it's useful to make sure that you've got a grasp on that before you go to learn the next bit of content. Most review exercises, I say give it a day or two, not this one. Just go do it. Do it now. It should be in order in your CCNA Reading Break playlist, and it'll be titled something like that. Hey, thanks for sticking until the end of this one. Again, I really do think it'd be useful for you to catch the other video straight from this same section of the book. It's very much related. But as always, if you're new here, hey, click subscribe, hit the bell so you'll be notified of new videos, and let me know what's going on in your mind. Give me a comment. Hey, appreciate it. Talk to you soon.